When Stanley came to America from Aberdeen, far in the northwest corner of Scotland, he came here as a storyteller. We were on a drive heading towards the mountains along the side of the Nolichucky River, and we stopped in a field, drove off the road and out through a little trail and parked and walked and rested to watch the river. I asked Stanley's permission to tell one of my favorite stories that he told, and in the silence before he responded, a great flock of northern wild geese came silently sailing just off the water's surface, upstream, we were resting on the river bank, and they could see in the water much more clearly than we could, for they turned around and they came to rest on a shoal that didn't even poke up out of the water, but was so shallow out in the middle of the river that they could all pause during their long journey in a safe spot and they turned and faced us. And Stanley asked me to tell him the story. Jack, you see, lived with his mother. Pretty far back in the woods, Jack was a natural. You have to be careful how you use that word if you go to Scotland. It means different things, like so many words, in different places. Jack was a natural. He was sort of, you might say, not all there. Don't know what we might call it now, but the thing about Jack is he was a good boy. He did whatever his mother asked of him, always had. He was cheerful, and he was a real hard worker. Well, they got by just the two of them on the sale of milk and cheese from their old goat and her goat was called Factor. That's an odd name for a goat, I know, but nonetheless, everybody around there knew it, and they laughed about it. And they laughed about Jack sometimes, but they never let him see it, because Jack was just golden. He took care of his mama and did whatever she asked always. Well, of a day, she came to him, and she said, Son... The actual factor, the bill collector, is due to come here today and collect the rent, just like he always does, and I have to go to town and sell milk and cheese. Now, if he comes while I'm gone, Jack, I want you to tell him to come in, make him comfortable, and tell him that I'll be back. Can you do that, son? Well, Jack, he looked at his mom and he he was thinking about what she'd said, and he started twisting this way and that, and, and he says, if the factor comes while you're gone, I'll tell him to come in, and, and I'll make him comfortable. And, and she said, that's good, that's good, son, and she left. Well, sure enough, she's hardly gone any time at all, and here comes a knock on the door, and it's the factor. He looks down at Jack. He says, Jack, is your mother here? And Jack just pushed the door and looked at him real serious. And he said, come in. Sit there by the fire and I'll fix you some tea and make you comfortable. Well, this feller's the bill collector. He was not a very popular man. So it was unusual for him to be shown hospitality. And cold day that it was, he surely was glad to sit by the fire for a few minutes. So here he is unbuttoning his coat and loosening his scarf, and he sat right where Jack would have him sit, right there by the fire, toasty warm as it was. Jack fixed him a cup of tea. And he sat there with Jack, Jack wasn't much of a conversationalist, as you might well guess. 
and the old man finished his tea and set it down on the floor right beside the great leather bag he always carried with him collecting the rent. And there he sat, and he went to sleep. But sitting right next to him on his own little chair, with his elbows on his knees and his chin in his hands, studying the old man, making sure he was comfortable, sat Jack. Well, somehow in the warmth of that little old cabin, a big old black fly got to buzzing around, and directly it came over and lit right in the middle of the old man's bald spot. Now, Jack noticed that because he was studying the old man, and that fly had caught his eye, and now it's on the old man's bald spot. And it's walking around and unrolling its little old tongue, and, and old Jack, he just had to do something because the old man was starting to twist this way and that. He could see that the fly was fixing to disturb him, and all he could think was his mama told him to make him comfortable. So he reached over beside of the fireplace and grabbed the first thing he could find, and one great big whack, he come down on the top of that old man's bald spot with a great big double-bitted axe. It was sitting there beside the fireplace and killed that fly dead as a doornail. And then looked at all that and just sat back down in his chair and waited for his mama. Well, along and along, whenever she got back, she walked in the door and she saw all that. She says, Jack, what have you done? And Jack, he's honest as the day is long. He just told it like it had happened. He said, you told me to make him comfortable, and that big old fly was just bothering the daylights out of him. I could see that he was sleeping easy till it come along, and I had to kill it. She said, all right, son, you had to kill a fly, but you've done kill the old man, too. And from the looks of things, there's no cure. He said, what must we do now, Mama? And she looked and thought and looked and thought. And she said, well, all I know to do is take him out and bury him. That's what you do when somebody dies. You go out in that back stall, and you, you'll you find a, a an old blanket hanging on a nail. You bring it in here, and we'll load him in it and take him out and bury him. And Jack, obedient to his mama, jumped up and just took off out the door to go find that blanket. And there she was, left with the old man. And inspecting him, she noticed beside his chair the empty teacup and the great leather pouch. And she took that pouch and she slipped it up into the chimney and stuck it up on the floor on the smoke shelf. Now, a chimney is called a lum in Scotland. So about that time, Jack comes back in, and he's got that blanket. And they spread it out on the floor, and they eased the old man onto it, took the old axe out of his head and cleaned it off and put it back beside the fireplace. He got one in, and she got the other, and they went out the door, they grabbed a shovel, and they started walking out into the big woods. And after a long time or a short time, I don't know, they finally came to a stopping place, and they started digging. Well, they took turns. It was cold, and the ground was hard, and after a while, they dug a right smart of a hole. And they drugged the man over to the edge of the hole, and they rolled him over in it. And they buried him there. They took the shovel, and they took the blanket, and they started back home. Well, Jack was in the lead, as was his way. And she's looking at her son, thinking he's such an innocent boy. He doesn't know what he's done. But if anybody ever says one word about the factor, Jack will tell the whole story just like it happened, whether I'm there or not. And she's thinking, he doesn't need to go to the penitentiary for his life. And she's thinking, how can I save my son? So they get on in home, 
and they put the blanket back on the nail, and they put the shovel away. In the time they got in the house, the fire had died down, but the house little cabin was still warm. She says, son, punch up the fire. Well, Jack was always obedient to his mama, and soon as she saw that he was busy doing that, she reached down beside of the fireplace, and she got this old iron pot. It still had a little bit of porridge left in it from that morning whenever they had a little something to eat. And she walked out the door. She went over to the cooling room, and she got a jug of milk. And she walked around behind their little cabin and up onto the hillside. And the hillside was so close to their house that in one step she could step off the hillside and on to the edge of the roof. So very quietly she walked over to the edge of the lum and she put down that great iron pot and she took the cork out of that milk jug and she started pouring the milk right down the lum. And when she got done with that, she took the lid off that pot and scraped all the old porridge right down the lum. Well, she got down and got shed of that stuff, and the time she walked in the door, Jack was fit to be tied. Mama, come here and look, see this. You'll never believe it. What is it, son? Come over here and look. She walked over, and he's pointing into the firebox. He says, look there. It was raining porridge and milk down the lump. Porridge and milk down the lump, Mama, look right there. Porridge and milk down the lump. She said, son, it's time for you to go to sleep. Well, Jack just immediately changed gears because his mama had told him to do something. So he walks over, and he starts getting ready, and directly he's all tucked in bed. And she sat down in that same old chair the old man had been in, and she was watching the fire and listening to Jack. He had his own little bed just right there in the corner of the room. And in a little while, she could tell by his breathing that Jack was sound asleep. Well, she tiptoed out, and she took her coat with her. She went and got that shovel, and she goes into the back of the barn and she takes a little rope and puts it around the goat's neck and starts leading the goat out to where they'd buried that man. Well, in the moonlight, she tied that goat up and she dug for just the longest. And finally, she came to the old man and she jumped down in the hole and she rolled him out on one side. And then she got out and she went over and led the goat over to the hole. She said, old girl, I hate to do this to you, but it's the only way. And she knocked that goat in the head and killed it. And put it in that same grave and buried it where the old man had been. And she loaded that old man on her old hull of a back and she drug him off into the deep woods. She dug and dug and dug until she had another grave and she buried him there. And she hid her trail very well. And she went on in home. And she got shed of all that stuff. And she went to sleep. Well, three, four, five days later, here's a knock at the door. And this time, it's the constable. And the constable says, How you do, ma'am? I'm looking for the factor. He's been missing, and I'm responsible for trailing around everywhere he would normally go to collect rent and what and all, and I know he would come here, and so I just thought I'd stop and ask what you what you know. Well, she looked right him, looked at him right in the face, and she said, well, he came here like he always did, and we showed him hospitality, and that's all I know. He said, well, several others have said the same, and I'm sorry to be troubling you now, and I'll be going, but Jack, he'd heard 
the name of the factor mentioned. And he comes over and he's grabbing the constable by his coat while he's starting to walk out the door. He says, you're not looking for the factor, are you? And he turns back around and he, he looks at Jack's mama and he looks down at Jack. He said, yes, Jack. He said, you don't know anything about his whereabouts, do you? He said, oh, I can show you right where he's buried. He says, buried? He says, the factor's, the factor's not dead, is is the factor dead? He says, the factor's dead. Of course the factor's dead. I'm the one that did the killing. And he looks back at Jack's mom, and she just shrugs her shoulders like she doesn't have a clue what he is talking about. He says, well, son, you lead the way, and you show me what you know. Well, they took a shovel, and Jack led the way till they come to that place where, where they, where they buried the old man. And the constable said, you sit right there, and he dug the hole. Well, along and along he came to something, and by now he's down in the hole, and he can see it's got fur on it. And he reaches down, and he grabs something and pulls up, and he's looking right straight into that goat's face. Everybody around there knew Jack called their goat factor. He says, Jack, come over here and look down in this hole. And Jack, he walked over and he looked down in there. And when he saw that goat, he said, now that's strange. He says, Jack, come on. You told me you killed the factor and you just killed your old goat now, didn't you? He said, no, I killed the factor. He says, come on, Jack, tell the truth. You said you killed the factor, but it was just this goat. Now, fess up. He said, no, I killed the, I killed the factor. I killed the, tell him, Ma, I killed the factor. She said, no, son, you didn't kill the factor. He says, Ma, you must remember that. She said, I'm, I'm sorry, son, I, I don't remember that. He says, Ma, it was the same day that it rained porridge and milk down the lum. Well, the constable heard that, and he jumped up out of that hole, and he starts poking Jack with his long, skinny finger. He says, All right, Jack, you killed the factor. How about we just leave it at that? And Jack, he looked at him. He said, well, that'd be okay. So they just barely covered up the goat. And then they all started in home. And when they got in home, they fixed the constable a little cup of tea, and he went on his way. Now, they never did find the factor. Nobody liked him much, and most folks just figured he had taken that money and gone over the boundary somewhere, never to be seen again. So along and along, Jack's mama finally decided that she was going to reach up in the smoke shelf one day, and she got a little money out of that pouch, and she got her another goat. And directly, she got herself another goat. And pretty soon she's selling milk and cheese and baby goats. And Jack, he's getting older now, and they're doing so well. He gets a day off now and again, and he always wants to go into town. He had a very favorite place he liked to be. He'd sit right there where everybody would come and draw their water who lived in that little town, and he'd just watch the town. But in particular, he liked to watch this one girl. And this day, she had come and sat right beside Jack where folks would come to draw their water, and they were both just sitting there watching the town. And Jack, he's swinging his legs, and he's looking straight ahead, and he says to her, I've been watching you. And she never even batted an eye. She didn't look at him, and she was swinging her legs. And she said, I know it. He said, these girls will come around here when somebody's visiting from somewhere else, and they always try to find you because they're going to offer you a sixpence and a penny. And you always take the penny. 
Now, even though it's bigger, you have got to know that it's not worth as much as a sixpence, and I can't figure out for the life of me why you always take the penny. Because they just laugh at you and run away. She sat there a little bit, and she said, Well, Jack, if I took the sixpence, they would never offer me any more money. And Jack, he said, I sort of like you. And she said, well, let's sit here and talk a little bit. And let me see if I love you or not. And they decided they loved each other. And after a while, they decided to get married. And it just was a lovely affair. They'd been all over to her house, and everybody had come, just the quality and all. And they just had dancing and food, and they had a big wedding. And then after a while, they'd gone over to Jack's house, and they'd done the same thing all over again. The time I got there, they'd already put Jack and that girl in their own room and turned a little pin on them. A lot of folks had already gone, and they were putting the food away, and they were about to turn in, or I'd heard more, but, but that's all I heard. When I finished the story, telling Stanley my version of the story I'd learned from him. The geese took wing and flew away upstream along the Nolichucky River. And I said, well, what do you think, Stanley? He said, you don't need my permission to tell that story. He said, all them geese just give it to you. What about that?